Thank you for the introduction. Hello, my name is Ruth Wolf and I am a Principal Field Application Scientist with Perkin Elmer. Welcome to our Masterclass webinar on understanding matrix interferences in ICP OES and strategies for dealing with them. Here are some of our learning goals for today's webinar. First, we will review the processes in the plasma because understanding these is a key to identifying and resolving matrix interferences. We also want to take a look at what types of results would indicate that you have a potential matrix interference. Next, we want to give you a few tools in how to test for matrix interferences and hopefully resolve them. And finally, we hope I have made this short enough to be able to answer some of your questions. So let's take a minute and talk about what an ICP is. ICP stands for inductively coupled plasma. In the ICP, typically argon gas is ionized for the plasma discharge, which is a collection of positive ions and electrons. What about the inductively part? In order to form and sustain the plasma, an RF field is inductively applied to the load coil or plates, which causes an oscillating AC current. This in turn causes electric and magnetic fields at the top of the ICP torch to remove electrons from the argon gas and ionize it. The argon ICP has a temperature of about 10,000 degrees centigrade and can ionize most elements in the periodic table. In ICP OES, the light emitted by the excited atoms and ions in the plasma is measured to obtain information about the analytes and their concentration in the sample. On an ideal day, a typical ICP OES analysis should go like this. The samples picked up by the auto sampler, the peristaltic pump and associated tubing delivers the sample to the nebulizer and the nebulizer converts the sample to an aerosol. The sample aerosol is conditioned by the spray chamber and then desolvated in the plasma. The elements in the dry aerosol in the plasma are vaporized and ionized by the plasma, and then the light emitted by the excited atoms and ions in the plasma is measured and converted to a concentration and the sample results are then printed or exported. As we all know, even though it seems rather simple, things can go wrong. So what do you do if things are not as expected or you get different results than you expected? First of all, besides some obvious issues that can occur with sample delivery that you should take care of during your pre-startup checks and maintenance, let's talk about some common reasons for seemingly wrong results. You can have spectral interferences, which is really not the subject of today's talk, but these can generally be resolved by using different analytical wavelengths, using MSF or multi-component spectral fitting to deconvolute partially overlapping peaks from different elements, or using inter-element corrections to correct for direct spectral overlaps. You can also have non-spectral or so-called matrix interferences, and that is the focus of our talk today. These are interferences that come from matrix induced changes in the signal intensity of your analyte. These can either be from concomitant elements, which are also present, or from changes in the acid content or strength in your calibration standards and samples. Matrix interferences have been studied in ICP OES since the early 1970s and can generally happen in the sample introduction system or in the plasma. There are some special types of these that have their own name, such as easily ionizable element effects or aerosol ionic redistribution effects. We'll touch on a couple of these briefly. Many of these types of interferences have been studied in quite some detail and have been the subject of many a PhD dissertation. In order to troubleshoot method problems that may be caused by matrix interferences, you need to understand the processes occurring in the plasma. These various processes are shown in the diagram on the left-hand side of the slide. The first function of the high temperature plasma is to remove the solvent or to desolvate the sample, leaving it as microscopic salt particles. Some of this process begins in the spray chamber and is greatly affected by the size of the aerosol droplets formed by the nebulizer, 
which is why your nebulizer and spray chamber selection are so important. The next step is vaporization of the salt particles into a gas of individual molecules. These molecules are then dissociated into atoms. These processes occur predominantly in the preheating zone, PHC, or the lower part of the plasma in the diagram shown on the right-hand side of the slide. The plasma has two remaining functions. These functions are excitation and ionization. Excitation and ionization occur predominantly in the initial radiation zone and the normal analytical zone shown in the figure on the right. The normal analytical zone of the plasma is where the analyte emission in ICP-OES is typically measured. Basically, matrix interferences in ICP affect the plasma processes somehow. All of these processes, nebulization, desolvation, vaporization, dissociation, excitation, and ionization, require energy and time. Studies have shown it takes a droplet about 12 milliseconds to travel through the plasma. So anything that would affect the rate or completeness of these processes can cause a non-spectral or a matrix interference. Most, about 85%, of all significant interferences occur during the nebulization stage due to changes in sample viscosity, surface tension, and density. This is why you should matrix match as closely as possible to get the best possible accuracy. Keep in mind that ICP OES is a comparative technique. You have to run blanks and standards to calibrate the instrument. The sample result is calculated by comparing the sample intensity to that of the calibration curve. It is critical that your signals are stable and reproducible. If your sample matrix is much different than that of your calibration standards, or you have a matrix interference present, this will change the slope of your calibration curve and lead to inaccurate results. A critical part of your ICP sample introduction system is the peristaltic pump. You may ask, why do we use a peristaltic pump in the first place? Although many of the nebulizers used in ICP are concentric nebulizers, such as a Meinhardt or a sea spray, and will self-aspirate, the use of a peristaltic pump is to ensure a constant regulated flow of sample to the nebulizer. The use of a peristaltic pump will minimize any effect of sample viscosity on your sample uptake rate. Poussel's law for laminar flow, which is the equation shown on the slide, describes the factors that influence liquid flow through an open tube. What is important to remember is that the flow rate is inversely proportional to tubing length and viscosity. The chart at the right shows the viscosities of several different liquids. Note how the viscosity is also temperature dependent. Using that chart and interpolating a bit with Purcell's law, let's say your lab temperature goes from 70 degrees to 85 degrees during a warm summer day. If you were self-aspirating, your sample flow rate could change by nearly 15%. This would lead to an inaccurate result. Or if you prepare your calibration curve using room temperature standards and then analyze your samples which were stored under refrigeration without allowing them to warm up, the sample flow rate could change by as much as 50% due to the viscosity differences between room temperature water and water at 4 degrees centigrade. And just because you are pumping your sample to the nebulizer doesn't mean you are entirely safe from problems. Worn or improperly tensioned pump tubing can also lead to flow rate changes and inaccurate results if things change between the time you ran your calibration standards and when you analyze your samples. It is becoming more common to use internal standards in ICP-OES to compensate for changes in sample delivery over time due to wear in pump tubing or changes in sample viscosity. Keep in mind that different diameter pump tubings may also wear differently. When selecting your internal standard element, be aware that it should not be present in your standards or your samples. You should also know if your internal standard analytical wa wavelength is an atom line or an ion line, as these, these may be affected differently by other types of interferences occurring in the plasma. 
the use of an internal standard cannot correct for all types of matrix interferences. You should understand the limitations of an internal standard. Most production labs use online mixing of the internal standards using a mixing tea, such as the one shown on the right hand side of the slide. You can individually spike samples, but this can be time consuming and can lead to errors if you are using small, less than 50 microliter spike volumes and you are not pipetting correctly. You can also potentially miss a sample or double spike a sample, which will lead to inaccurate results. Keep in mind you also need to maintain or replace worn or contaminated mixing teas. This does happen and be aware of the material used in your mixing tea and contamination. Some mixing teas are made of glass and can cause contamination for elements such as boron, sodium, silicon, calcium, and magnesium, and other elements if you are looking at low levels. You also want a mixing tea with a low dead volume to avoid sample carryover and replace them periodically as they can be contaminated by high levels of elements present in your samples over time. Finally, you need to ensure the sample flow and the internal standard flow are mixing. Look for RSDs of 1-2% to or less for your internal standard when looking at replicates. If RSDs are higher, suspect things are not mixing well or look for air bubbles. High RSDs in your internal standard will cause more error in your analytical results. So let's talk a little bit about what happens to your sample and our internal standard once it gets to the nebulizer. The picture on the right is a schematic of a typical concentric style nebulizer where the sample comes up through the center capillary and the nebulizer gas comes out of the concentric ring or annulus around the sample capillary. As the gas escapes from the annulus at high velocity, it creates an area of reduced pressure which draws the liquid through the central sample capillary. This is why concentric nebulizers will self-aspirate. The high velocity of the nebulizer gas shears the liquid coming up the sample capillary into a fine mist of aerosol droplets. If you hold your nebulizer against a dark background, you should be able to see the mist or the aerosol being formed. There have been a lot of studies done on what happens to these aerosol droplets in the ICP. These studies are done using a variety of methods including laser Doppler radar on single droplets. First, as the aerosol enters the spray chamber, the larger droplets are removed to the spray chamber drain. This is about 95 to 98 percent of all the droplets that your nebulizer produces. The smaller droplets start to desolvate and the water evaporates from the surface. As this happens, the droplet diameter gets smaller and a salt crust starts to form around the droplet. The water inside the salt crust begins to heat and boil and the internal pressure builds. Then the droplet finally explodes and the water vapor left inside the droplet cools the surroundings. The remaining particles dehydrate and evaporate to a gas. Finally, the atoms of the elements in the particles are excited or ionized and emit the light we measure in the ICP. These single droplet studies have shown us over the years since ICP was developed as an analytical technique that different acid and salt content can change the timing of these processes occurring in the plasma. Not only is concentration important, but also identity. High levels of some elements, such as calcium, can form a very resistant hard shell around the aerosol particles. This delays the atomization and ionization processes, which result in a long stabilization time being required in the plasma. And remember, you typically only have about 12 milliseconds for all of these processes to occur in the plasma. So why would a different type of acid or the presence of ethanol or methanol, an organic solvent, cause these effects? The answer lies in the somewhat complicated Nukiyama and Tanizawa equation, which is shown below. 
The key thing to remember here is that the diameter of an aerosol droplet, called the solder mean diameter, is proportional to the liquid viscosity and inversely proportional to the density. Plus, the diameter also depends on both the gas flow rate as well as the liquid flow rate. The takeaway message for this slide is that the aerosol diameter depends on the identity and the characteristics of your solution. So if your standards and samples have different characteristics, you will have different size droplets being produced and these may not behave the same way in your ICP and this is what causes a matrix interference. Remember the aerosol diameter affects many things. The transport efficiency to the plasma, the rate of desolvation and vaporization, and ultimately the production of the analyte atoms or ions that you are trying to measure and your analyte signal intensity. The aerosol diameter is not only impacted by the density and viscosity of the solution, but it also depends on the type of nebulizer you are using and the type of spray chamber. The aerosol diameter can also depend on the concentration of the acid you are using. The chart below was taken from a research paper referenced at the bottom of the slide and shows that between a deionized water solution and a solution containing 25% nitric acid, the particle mean diameter entering the plasma changes by nearly one micron. This doesn't seem like much, but it can have a huge effect on what happens to those particles in the plasma when you only have 12 milliseconds for those particles to be ionized. And just changing the gas flow rate or the nebulizer gas setting on your ICP can also have some effect on the aerosol and your analy analytical signals. In addition, the presence of volatile compounds in your sample matrix, such as hydrochloric acid or ethanol or methanol, which tend to form smaller droplets in the nebulizer that are more easily atomized or ionized can lead to signal enhancements. The analytical implication of this is seeing elevated results for these types of samples when compared to calibration curves prepared only in dilute nitric acid. Keep in mind that different nebulizer and spray chamber combinations will have different characteristics. There are numerous combinations possible, as the photos at the bottom of this slide indicate. You also need to make sure that your nebulizer and spray chamber are compatible with your sample matrix. For example, if you have hydrofluoric acid present, you generally can't use a glass sample introduction system. Generally, you want a sample introduction system that provides small droplets, which are desolvated and vaporized faster than the larger droplets. You also want to have a narrow size distribution so that the desolvation and vaporization processes are consistent. I borrowed the figure in the upper right hand side of this slide from a presentation given nearly 20 years ago comparing the aerosol mean diameter from two different nebulizers. In this case, a concentric Meinhardt TR30 on the left and a Miramist nebulizer on the right. These are two commonly used nebulizers in ICP OES. As the results of this study show, the smallest aerosol droplet size for the Miramis nebulizer at 9 microns was slightly smaller than the 11 micron droplet size produced by the Meinhardt TR30 nebulizer. However, if you look at the size of the colored plots, which is indicative of the size distribution for each nebulizer, the TR30 nebulizer produces a much tighter or consistent droplet size and is generally one of the preferred nebulizers for ICP OES analysis. Studies on the fate of the droplets once they reach the plasma show that virtually no analytical signal results from droplets that are greater than 8 to 10 microns once they reach the plasma. There is just not enough time for them to ionize or vaporize. Most of your analyte signal results from droplets that enter the plasma at less than 3 microns in diameter. These smaller droplets have enough time in the 12 millisecond plasma transit time to vaporize, atomize, and ionize, leading to your analytical signal. So what does this all really mean? Here's a rule of thumb to remember about when you may expect some types of matrix interferences. Assuming you have matched the acid type and concentration between your standards and your samples, 
When your TDS, or your total dissolved solids level, exceeds about 1000 ppm, the changes in the surface tension, density, and viscosity will begin to affect your droplet size distribution, and you will need to worry about matrix interferences. Remember that your cations will have matching anions, and these factor into the equation. You may also have total organic carbon and dissolved organic carbon. So a multi-element standard containing 10 elements at 50 ppm could cause some issues, as well as a 500 ppm standard of the big four cations, sodium, calcium, magnesium, and potassium. Next, we're going to look at an example. In this example, I calibrated up to 500 ppm with a solution that contained calcium, potassium, magnesium, and sodium. We are looking at the calcium 317 line. So using those calibration standards, here are my results when I analyzed a 500 ppm calcium standard without any other cations present and a mixed standard containing 500 ppm aluminum, calcium, magnesium, and 200 ppm iron. This is commonly referred to as ICSA for most environmental labs. If you look at the measured calcium values in ppm, which are indicated in the right column in the red text, you can see that my calcium standard is reading high at 531 when it should be 500. And the ICSA solution is also reading high at 539.1 ppm calcium. What is going on? In this slide, which is the same data, I've also added the intensities for calcium as well as for scandium, which I had in the samples as an internal standard, but I did not apply it when the results were calculated. See how the intensities of the scandium in red for my highest two calibration standards drop from the original level in the calibration blank. This is an indication that there is a matrix interference occurring. However, when we look at the scandium levels in the calcium only sample and in the ICSA sample, we see those intensities are different than in my calibration standards. So something in the makeup of my calibration standards and my two samples is different, and this is affecting something in the plasma processes going on and in my results. Since scandium is being suppressed in the calibration standards in a similar manner to calcium, perhaps by applying the scandium as an internal standard, we can correct for this matrix interference. In this slide, we see the results using scandium as the internal standard for calcium during the calibration and for the two samples. Note that the green calculated concentration values are much closer to the 500 ppm values that I expected, or what I prepared them to be, with the internal standard applied. Just a note, in the upper right hand corner, I have pulled the lines from the wavelength table built into the Syngistic software, showing that calcium and scandium are both ion lines. This is indicated by the Roman numeral two in the state column. A value of one here would indicate an ion line. So this is great. I just need to use scandium as my internal standard and all is well. Well, maybe not so fast when we take a look at the magnesium results. Here we see that magnesium values in my two samples, the single element magnesium and the ICSA, shown in red in the middle column, are even more out in the initial measurements without the scandium internal standard applied than the calcium results were initially. Reprocessing this data using the scandium internal standard applied to magnesium, shown in the rightmost column in the blue text, improves things, but not completely. This could mean that another interference effect is involved. This is pretty common that there is more than one type of matrix interference occurring in a sample. If we look at the magnesium line I am using, we notice that it is an atom line, or the state is one in the state column. Scandium is an ion line, so it could be that perhaps an internal standard element using an atom line, such as gallium, might work better for magnesium. Unfortunately, today we won't know the answer to that question, since in this data I did not include the use of gallium as an internal standard. 
probably the most commonly encountered matrix interferences are those of the EIE or easily ionizable elements. EIEs are elements with very low first ionization potentials and they are one of the most studied matrix interferences in both ICP-OES and ICP-MS. EIEs cause changes in the analytical signal because they modify the state of the analyte in the plasma, the plasma thermal characteristics, or the analyte excitation efficiency and spatial distribution in the plasma. In short, the presence of an EIE can change the slope of your calibration curve, leading to an incorrect result if your sample matrix differs significantly from that of your calibration. The most commonly encountered EIEs are lithium, sodium, potassium, and cesium. Their interference effect is generally proportional to their ionization potential, which is highlighted in the magenta text on the slide. Here is an example of an EIE interference in a QC failure example. In this example, the ICV and the CCV QC samples run immediately after calibration pass. However, the CCV run after the first 10 samples fails with about 150% recovery. Note the measured analyte concentrations in these samples aren't really high. They're generally less than 20 ppm. What is wrong? Is the instrument broken? The answer is no, you have an EIE interference. In this example, yttrium was added to the standards and the samples as a possible stand internal standard, but it was not applied during the calculations. If you look at what is happening to the internal standard intensities, you see that they are okay in the initial ICV CCV plus or minus 20% of the calibration blank, but as we start to run samples, they increase dramatically to as much as 180% of the intensity in the original blank in some of the samples. Keep in mind that the internal standard concentration is the same in all of the standard samples, QC samples, and the blank. So it's probably a matrix interference causing these problems, but the question is, what is causing it? Our concentrations of the elements we measured in those samples aren't that high. Fortunately, this data was collected with Universal Data Acquisition, or UDA, turned on. UDA stores the intensities for all the analytical wavelengths on the detector so that you can reinterrogate the data later. This is a great troubleshooting tool and lets you go back and look at elements that were not in your original analytical method to see if there might be an EIE or other element causing the issues. This feature is available on all simultaneous Perkin-Elmer ICP OES instruments. All you need to do is enable it on the Options tab of your method when you collect your samples. Just check the UDA box on the Options page. I've also included in the handouts section our technical note on UDA that you can download to learn more about this feature. Since the data was collected with UDA enabled, I can go back into my method and add elements such as sodium, potassium, and lithium, shown in the magenta box, that could be causing matrix interferences. I can also enable yttrium as the internal standard and then reprocess the sample data. Once I enable the internal standard and reprocess the data, the CCV check standard after the first 10 samples now passes within the limits of 90 to 110% recovery. However, we should still understand why the yttrium internal standard intensities are so high in the samples and in the second CCV, since this was the exact same solution as the initial CCV and then yttrium recovery went from 116% in the initial CCV to 162% in the CCV after the 10 samples. This has to be a matrix interference. So let's look at those EIE elements I added to the method when I reprocessed the data. Looking at the corrected intensity data tab, we see that the samples have very high, greater than 150 million counts per second of sodium and also high potassium and lithium values. All three of these elements are EIEs and likely causing the signal enhancements for the yttrium internal standard. 
Although we saw in the previous slide using yttrium did successfully correct for the signal enhancement in the second CCB, I would urge you to use caution whenever your internal standard recoveries vary by more than plus or minus 30% from the initial value in your calibration blank. The internal standard is essentially correcting your sample results automatically, and if you have a large correction, this can lead to some error in your results. I would always recommend doing a dilution or a spike recovery test to confirm your sample results when you see large changes in the internal standard intensity. Another thing to point out, highlighted in the green boxed areas, is that the high sodium, potassium, and lithium concentrations are not washing out of the spray chamber with the existing wash times in the method, and this is causing carryover of the high sodium levels in the spray chamber for at least the blank and the CCV analyzed after the last actual sample, as is shown by the elevated levels measured in the blank check sample run just before the second CCV. So in this case, the residual high sodium from the samples carrying over is responsible for the EIE matrix effect on your second CCV check sample. And you should probably go back to your method and increase your wash time in between your samples. So let's talk a minute about one of the common tests you can use for a suspected matrix interference. That's the dilution test. If you see enhancement or suppression in your internal standard element, you can simply dilute your sample, generally 2x, 5x, 10x, or 20x is sufficient. I typically do two different levels of dilution so I can compare the results, both for the internal standard and for the measured concentrations. Keep in mind what your detection limit is for the analyte concentrations as you dilute so you aren't comparing signals you have diluted out of your detection range. In this example, my sample called UDA, which contains one ppm of about 50 elements, is showing different concentrations for some elements at different dilution factors, and my internal standard intensity in the undiluted sample is very high. Without the internal standard applied, some elements agree well, shown in green, and others do not, shown in red. When I apply the internal standard, more elements agree at least for the first two dilution levels. In the undiluted sample, we see 150% recovery for the scandium internal standard element. When reviewing the stocks used to make this standard, I discovered that one of the stocks actually had scandium in it. So in the undiluted sample, the scandium level was high enough to skew my internal standard recoveries. This serves to illustrate an important point when using an internal standard. That element that you choose to be your internal standard cannot be in your sample, or if it is, you need to spike the internal standard in at a high enough level that it doesn't skew your results. Generally, the intensity of the natural level of an internal standard element should be less than 10% of the signal at the level you are using for the internal standard. This is why in the 5 and 10x dilution samples, the scandium isn't skewing the internal standard results as much as in the undiluted sample. Earlier, when we looked at the magnesium data, I mentioned that we may want to use a different internal standard with an atom line rather than an ion line, since the magnesium line we had in our method was an atom line. If you have matrix effects, you may need to change the viewing height in radial view to minimize their effects on atom lines. Remember that atom lines are viewed lower in the plasma than ion lines. If you are using axial view, the plasma shear air knife in all Perkinomer Optima and Avio ICPs serves to cut off the cool tail plume of the plasma, which is another source of matrix interferences. Although plasma shear works well for most situations, if you are looking at higher concentrations, the axial view has a more limited linear range than the radial view. Radial viewing also allows you to change the viewing height to optimize your results. Let's look at an example of this. First of all, it is critical as you are troubleshooting to know whether you are using atom lines or ion lines in your analyses. On the left-hand side of this screen, I'm showing the spectrometer tab of the analytical method. 
If you click on the spectrometer tab in your method and click on the wavelength table selection down in the lower part of that window, then you can search for your element of interest. This is shown in the figure on the right. When you select the element of interest, the state column will show you whether that analytical line is either an atom line, where the state has a Roman numeral one in there, or it's an ion line where the Roman numeral in the state column is two. Knowing whether you are using atom lines or ion lines can be the key to figuring out some of your interferences. Optimizing the radial viewing height in ICP is often neglected. In fact, some manufacturers have eliminated this ability in their instruments. All Perkin Elmer ICPs can have the radial viewing height adjusted on a per element basis. This can be critical when looking at elements where high levels of EIEs, such as lithium, sodium, and potassium are present, especially if your analyte line is an atomic line. In general, the best emission from an atom line will be lower in the plasma, so this is why you want to optimize the viewing height in the method. Simply click on the Vary by Analyte button in the Sampler tab of the method, and you can set the viewing heights for each radial mode analyte. Let's look at an example of how viewing height can affect precision. Our example is the determination of weight percent levels of silicon, reported as silicon dioxide, in a lithium metaborate sample matrix. Lithium is an EIE and it is there in high concentrations. Control of the silicon dioxide is critical for our industrial process. The issue reported is the control samples are reporting low recoveries with poor long-term stability with RSDs greater than 0.2%. All of our silicon lines are atom lines. Silicon 251 was used because it was the most sensitive line and the default radial viewing height of 15 millimeters was being used for the initial analyses. So we want to do a study to see if the viewing height has an effect on the accuracy and precision of our control sample. You can easily set up your method to put the element of interest in the same method at different viewing heights. Note that we were using Yttrium is the internal standard, and we also match the yttrium viewing height to the analyte. The picture here on the left shows that the plasma tab of the method where we have varied the viewing height for the various silicon and yttrium lines being collected. A series of over 400 measurements were made over two days, and here are the results. We see that the mean values are lower than expected and the RSD is higher than the limit of 0.2% at the viewing heights of 15, 13, and 12 millimeters. However, at a 10 millimeter viewing height, the mean value matches the historical values for the control sample and the precision is 0.2%, which was what was acceptable. So changing the viewing height corrected the reported long-term reproducibility and stability issues. So why did the viewing height matter? Remember that silicon is an atom line and atom lines are viewed lower in the plasma. Depending on the matrix, sample uptake rate and aerosol characteristics, the optimum viewing position might change. One test you can perform is a sodium or yttrium bullet test. In this test, you analyze a 1,000 ppm sodium or yttrium standard and take note of where the different colored emission lines are relative to the top RF plate or coil. Sodium and yttrium are used because both the atomic and ionic emissions are in the visible range, either red or blue. The lower colored emission where I have circled in pink and is generally red if you look at the base of the plasma, is from the yttrium atoms. The upper colored emission, which is blue in this picture and circled in yellow, is from the yttrium ions. Note that these colors may, depend, may vary depending on the element you use for the test. Remember that the standard default viewing height in radial mode is 15 millimeters above the top of the RF plate or coil. You should also pay attention to the torch depth setting on your torch cassette, as this will impact the distance by moving the torch up or down inside the RF plates. 
Be careful if your viewing height is in the transition area between atomic and ionic emission. This is where the greatest variability will be, and this was our issue in the previous example for silicon when it was being measured at 15 millimeters viewing height. Also, you should do your sodium or yttrium bullet test at your intended sample flow rate using the spray chamber and nebulizer that you are going to use for your analysis. So why did I make this last statement about using the same spray chamber and nebulizer for your analysis when you're do doing a yttrium or sodium bullet test? This is because the atomic emission zone location can vary with the sample uptake rate you are using and the aerosol droplet size. So it's important to use the same sample introduction system that you're using for your analysis when you do these tests to figure out your viewing heights. So we are about out of time for today, but let's do a quick review of our matrix interference toolbox. First of all, anytime you don't get the expected answer and you've made your standards and samples correctly, you should suspect a matrix interference, especially if your calibration matrix and or acid content is different from your unknown sample or your QC samples. And yes, a 1-2% to 2 difference can matter. And this includes elements that are there that you aren't looking for, such as the sodium in a brine sample or the lithium in a fusion sample. Be alert for anything that can change the viscosity or density of your calibration solutions or your samples. Also pay attention to things that can change the sample delivery flow rate, such as using self-aspiration, worn tubing, and viscosity, especially if you may have organic solvents present. Now let's review some of the tests you can perform to test for matrix interferences. First, you can do a simple dilution test. If you collected or can recollect the data using UDA, you can look for EIE elements that aren't in your method as an analyte. If your problem is with the radial mode elements versus axial mode elements, know whether you are using an atom line or an ion line and if the problem exists with one emission type or the other. Finally, let's review some of the corrective actions you can take. If you are not, you could use an internal standard and change the internal standard used to better compensate by matching the emission type, either atom or ion line. You can better matrix match your samples and standards. This is actually one of the easiest things you can do on samples that are digested or prepared. There is also the option of doing a method of standard additions calibration where you spike your standards into separate aliquots of your sample. This can be time consuming, but if accuracy in a difficult matrix is critical, it's the best possible solution. And finally, you can dilute the sample to minimize the interference effects. Again, a simple solution, but you need to realize this may degrade your detection limits since generally you need to multiply your reporting limit by the dilution factor being used. Finally, I'd like to make a couple rather simple summary statements. First of all, if you are able to get a signal and construct a calibration curve but are not getting the expected results on samples and or QC samples, this does not mean that your instrument or the hardware is broken. Generally, 95% of the time, the weird results are due to something else. Matrix interferences are often the culprit but unrecognized by a lot of users of ICP with many years experience. Hopefully today's talk has given you an understanding of what they are how they occur and how to test for them in addition to some ways to mitigate their effects on your results. Before we go to questions, I'd like to include a reference that is very useful and summarizes a lot of more than 50 years of research into matrix effects in ICP and we are still learning about them. And now we are out of time, so just a quick note that I put a few items up in the handout section of the webinar for you that you may find useful, including our ICP Concepts booklet, which gives a good overview of the ICP technique, a PDF of this presentation, and our technical note on UDA or Universal Data Acquisition. 
I'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar. And if you'd like to download today's presentation and the other, other reference materials, you can do that by clicking on the Handouts tab and selecting the items available that you wish to download. And now, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. All right. Well, thanks, Ruth. That was a really good uh, masterclass in ICP OES. Um, a lot of detail there for sure. Um, I'm just kind of going through some of the questions uh, that people have submitted here. Uh, just a reminder to everybody, you can uh, enter questions in the web or in the desktop application in the questions uh, panel there. Just type it in, hit send, and uh, Ruth and I will uh, go through them. You there still, Ruth? Yep. I had to unmute All myself. Right. <laughs> All right. And, uh, and as Ruth mentioned, there are the handouts uh, as well. There's uh, three handouts available, one of which is a copy of the slide deck. So um, hopefully uh, that is handy for you. Okay, so getting to the questions. Um, first question, can you explain matching of line types like atom to atom or ion to ion uh, type of matching? Uh, so, yeah, so this is probably a relation uh, to internal standards. Um, yeah, most typical... Yeah, most typical internal standards we use in ICP OES are uh, scandium and yttrium. And generally the lines used for those, the most uh, uh, intense lines are the ion lines of those two elements. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we find that the scandium or yttrium does not really correct for a matrix interference that's going on with our analyte of interest. And if that seems to be the case, one thing you can do is go look at your analyte and double check and see if you're using an atom line where the state uh, is one in that column in the wavelength table or an ion line where the state is two. And if you have a mismatch between your internal standard um, and your uh, analyte, you know, one's an ion line, one's an atom line, you might find better results from an internal standard if you can match the state of that internal standard. So using an element um, that's not in your sample, of course, that um, has an atom line with good intensity where you can you can spike that element into your sample or tee it in. Uh, a couple that have been used by um, some of my customers have been germanium and gallium. Uh, which seem to you be used for a lot of uh, atom line um, internal yeah, standards. Because they have higher ionization potential. So yes. mostly yep. atom line emission, atomic emission, basically. Um, yep. Yeah, I, I mean, and it's not, in my experience, it's not, it depends on the matrix, right? So it'll really depend, if you have a simple matrix, there's, there's not much plasma loading, right? And you're not right. totally disturbing um the plasma then it's not as big of a deal and uh, the internal standard still if it's at, even if it's an ionic line correcting for an atomic line i find it'll do fine for physical interferences right that does well there and uh, so yeah so it, it depends on the sample types but yeah that that's that's what we we try to achieve um um you know, matching if possible, but most of the time we, we don't really need to. Um, depends on the application. All right, so got a few questions here now. Um, just making my way through it. Um, there was a question on how is the dilution test done? Um, I remember you had a slide there in the past, I think you were referring to where you did where you did dilution and then you're verifying that the result is the same at that dilution, right? Yep. Yeah. So basically you dilute your sample, you know, one to two or one to five. 
Um, and I would dilute it with whatever the acid matrix is in my calibration blank. Um, you know, so if you're using a mix of hydrochloric and nitric acids in your calibration standards, you should dilute your, your sample with that same matrix that you're using for your calibration. Um, and then what you want to look for is once you um, adjust for your dilution factor, so you can, when you run that sample, you can put a dilution factor in the sample information file and the software will calculate um, your concentration results with with the dilution factor. And if you see that you get different results mm -hmm. at different dilution factors, you probably have a matrix interference occurring. And what you mm -hmm. might see is you might see different results for different elements. So not ever, <laughs> when you have matrix interferences, one of the tricky things to realize is not every element is going to be affected the same way. Um, it all depends on what their ionization potential is, what line you're using, um, and what matrix elements you have present. Yeah, yeah, it's fair. very good. Yeah, it does uh, it does vary from sample type for sure. Um, hey, this is a good question. If you are adding an internal standard using a mixing T, is there any concern with uneven wear on the different tubing, uh, the sample versus the internal standard tubing leading to the mixing T? Um, yes, there can be. So um, typically we use um, a smaller diameter tubing for our internal standard. Um, you know, typical in ICP OES is we use maybe red red for the sample or black black for the sample and something like orange green for the internal standard, which would give you about a one to four uh, dilution factor. So you typically we don't want to dilute our, our sample using our internal standard. Um, and those smaller diameter tubings can wear faster, especially if you have them over tensioned, but you also mm -hmm. need to pay attention to the tension of the tubing over, especially if you're doing long runs, you know, eight hour, 10 hour, 24 hour long runs. Um, and one indication you could see that the tubing wear, uh, or tubing is wearing differently is as the course of your run goes on, um, you might see your RSDs for your internal standard elements increase over time. And that's kind of an indication that, that your internal standard tubing might be wearing, or you might need to adjust the tension uh, because as that tubing wears and becomes less elastic, you generally have to apply more tension on the tensioning arms to get the same flow out of it. Good, good point. Yeah, I see that a lot. A lot of over tensioning happening and premature yeah. wearing of tubing and uneven wearing of tubing and and uh, I've also seen rotations in the tubings you know not put on right so they don't they wear yeah. unevenly. Um, another thing I see is that sometimes the RPM like on pumps are way too high, uh, and so that really high RPM will also you know wear things a little bit faster. So you want not too slow of an RPM, but not a super fast RPM uh, as yeah. well. So there's a few considerations. If you need to have that high of a flow, then you may want to consider going to a higher internal diameter tubing, right? Yeah. Yeah. I guess the really the other thing I've seen is, you know, depending on your manufacturer of your ICP, there are different uh, pump head sizes. So there, everything used to be a standard two so two stop. Uh, pump, but some instruments use mini pumps, which have a smaller distance between the stops on the peri pump tubing. You want to make sure that you're buying the correct tubing um, mm -hmm. for your pump, because even if it's, you know, it might be a mini or a small pump, there are at least two different sizes of mini pump tubings, one with a, a 75 millimeter diameter or 75 millimeter spacing between those stops and one with like a 90 five mil, uh, millimeter spacing. And if you use the wrong uh, pump tubing on your pump, it's going to be improperly tensioned. So you, you do need to pay attention to that, especially if you're you know, buying your pump tubing from a third party supplier, you need, you need to pay attention. And you know, even if you're buying your tubing from Perkin Elmer, we have three different uh, pump head styles. So you wanna make sure that you've, you've got the right tubing for your, your pump. Yeah. 
Yeah, good point. Um, uh, this was an oil analysis question. Will the same particle size issues be present in a solvent-based sample? Sure. Um, yes, it, it, it can be. I mean, anything that affects the viscosity and uh, surface tension of, of the liquid will, will can change the particle size that's being generated by the nebulizer, right? So it all comes down to that. So, you know, if, if you're using different organic solvents or your, your samples have one organic solvent, but your rinse has a slightly different organic solvent, you wanna make sure that you've completely uh, rinsed out the different organic solvent from your rinse station before you hit your sample. And you also wanna make sure that, you know, you're using the same solvent mix or matrix in your calibration standards that's in your samples, as close as you can get. Yeah, that, I agree. Um, I know we're already over the hour, but there's a few more questions. So to go through. I, I, Ruth, do you have a few more minutes? Or? Yep. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. We'll, we'll, we'll work to some of these. Um, one question is, you know, how closely should I be matching my acid concentrations in my samples and standards? So my kind of ruler thumb is I like to be within um, one or two percent. I've seen some pretty drastic things occur if I make my calibration standards, let's say in 1% nitric acid, and my samples have 5% nitric acid and vice versa. So, you know, you, you want to get as, as close as you, you can be. Um, generally, you know, if, if you're matching within one or 2%, those differences are somewhat negligible. It might be a little more critical I've seen when you have hydrochloric acid present. So yeah. hydrochloric acid is a little bit more volatile and the more hydrochloric acid you have, the more volatile that matrix is. So that can affect the particle size more. Good point, yeah. yeah. You, you don't see it as much with nitric, but more with HL for yeah. sure. Um, we had a question, do you offer the same, the same Topic for ICPMS? Yes, actually, in two weeks. Uh, we're just two doing weeks. one for <laughs> ICPMS. <laughs> um, I have a bunch of questions trying to get. Uh, so there's this one question a uh, customer had. He, he's running engine oil blends uh, and noticed internal standard, which is cobalt, goes in, is in the 60 to 85% recovery range. Um, but I'm assuming this is for samples, but I'm not totally sure what, uh, but there's no more information there. Is there any way to get it higher? Well, I would suspect if, it, if it's for samples, it could just be truly that's what's happening, right? It's, you know, viscosity related uh, is the big driving factor for oils analysis, viscosity, right? So if you have changes yeah. in viscosity versus, you know, your, your standard, your 100% your internal standard um, response, then you're going to get a lower, you know, percent recovery on the on the subsequent samples that have a greater viscosity. That's, yep. Yep. You know. And one of one of the things you can do for those samples is on your engine oils, if you're typically diluting one to ten with V-solve or kerosene or whatever your your diluent is, if you did a one to twenty dilution mm -hmm. on that particular sample. Um, and make sure that when you do your dilution, you're not also diluting your your internal standard. Um, so you need to, you know, typically we put our our cobalt in our in our uh, diluent. Um, so if you dilute that sample, just do a simple one to two dilution on it, um, making sure you have your cobalt in there at the same level, um, and run that. And generally, if you have a matrix effect that's you know, you'll see that the internal standard uh, recoveries on a dilution will will be better. Good so. point. Yep. Yeah, that's a good point. Yep. Yeah. Do a, first do a one to two with with solvent with no internal standard. Then do your normal one to ten, right? Yep. 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 For sure. That's a good point. Um, 
so I get that I do get this question often. Let's see. Is there any specific concentration with regard to internal standard concentration? Or how do we pick that? Um, you well, you a you want to make sure that you're picking an element that's not going to be in most of your samples. And if it is there in a low level, like most soil samples that are digested, you might have a little scandium there. So you want to make sure that you you are adding an internal standard to such a level where you get pretty good counts. Um, Aaron can comp my typical um, sort of spiking level is where I see an intensity for my internal standard of a couple hundred thousand. Yeah. Uh, you know, to 500,000 counts. I don't like it when it goes up into the into the million counts because that kind of, you know, puts some uh, wear on the detector and you can actually overrange sometimes. So, um, you know, but you want to have a decent count rate in there um, so that you have A and so that you have good statistics. So when you look at okay. statistics and RSDs, you really have to be over 100,000 counts to get you know, less than 1% RSDs on your internal standards. So that's that's yeah. kind of my rule of thumb is I, you know, I kind of go 200 to 500,000 counts um, for my internal standard yeah. element. Yeah, same here. I'm, I'm usually trying to hit the 100,000 plus kind of range. Yeah, yeah. Which, which generally goes down, it depends on, again, it depends on your instrument and your sample introduction system. It could be anywhere from, you know, one to 10 ppm of the element typically yeah what matrix you're using there's a there's a lot of variables there yeah but yeah that's kind of it's, it's the statistics yeah it's a can so you're above your background above your noise that's not a factor in the internal standard response that's kind of you know like the key thing um, the internal standard is just responding to you know what's happening in the sample introduction and in the plasma and the spectrometer potentially so um so is there i, I kind of get this question once in a while is there any level of measurement that's considered too low to use a t-fitting for internal standards versus you know just spiking it in individually uh, um i'm not quite sure <laughs> I think I think they I think they mean like if you're doing ultra trace work, um, yeah. no, uh, yeah, I mean typically when we do ultra ultra trace like clean room style work, um, yeah, we we're actually not even using internal standard to yeah. try to try to do matrix matching and, and even method of standard addition. So we do, in those instances we don't even use internal standards. Um, so in, in general, it's really you, it's it's precision more or matrix correcting kind of objectives um, more than the concentration levels in my opinion um, you know so uh, usually T when you're pumping things in there's going to be a little bit more noise of course versus you know spiking but individual spiking is then you know got human error possibly <laughs> so and is more tedious. Yeah, I guess I guess the other comment would to make be make would be to make sure that you check your if you're worried about the internal standard affecting uh, you know contaminating your your samples or adding additional elements to your samples that you're looking for. You should mm -hmm. probably check your internal standard um, for impurities mm -hmm. before you before you use it. You know, and you want to buy. Um, I didn't really comment on on this at all in the talk, but whenever you do ICP, you should be buying ICP grade standards. You should not use AA grade standards uh, in your ICP. And when you're doing multi-element standards, um, it's usually best to buy your multi-element standards from a manufacturer because they will check um, that you know when they're adding, let's say you have a multi-element standard with 25 elements in it, they will check each one of those individual components for contamination levels and take that into account if they're mm -hmm. present when they make that multi-element standard. When you make your own multi-element standards from single element standards, uh, there's pretty much no way you're going to take into account that your 1,000 ppm copper stock might have, you know, 20 ppb of nickel in it or 100 ppb of nickel in it. So very good point. Um, yeah. 
you need to be aware of that. Yep, that's that's a really good thing to mention. Yeah, you got all the reagents as well. So a lot of the time, the level of the concentration you can hit is dependent on all, everything you're using, right? So um, that's more of a consideration usually. Um, I know we're <laughs> pushing time, but it looks like there's still people hanging out here. Um, let's see. Um, well, a lot of very specific questions. See if things are more general. Um, I don't know if we can get to it all. Um, Oh, so I mean, this one, one comment, would it be work best on multi-element solutions to add both an atomic and ionic line and internal standard? And yes, I mean, we basically, Ruth basically answered that for it. It's nice to have both if you, if you can, um, but you don't always need it, right? Uh, I don't think it, you know, a lot of time you can get away with just uh, stitrium, for example. As long as you yeah. samples don't have it. Um, um, what, I mean, they, there's a lot of questions. There's a couple of questions what to consider when using the nebulizer. What was that? What to consider when choosing a nebulizer? I mean, we oh. could have a whole webinar on nebulizer <laughs> selection, I was, couldn't we? I was, I was <laughs> actually thinking that by, that might be another webinar topic is <laughs> yeah. how, to, how to select a nebulizer and spray chamber um kind of the biggest considerations are a do you have particulates in your samples can you filter the samples like you know our wear metals analysis uh users they use a, a low flow gem cone and that's because the low flow gem cone can handle particulates um if you want uh better matrix tolerance for high TDS samples to begin with, you might want to use something like a sea spray or a mirror mist. Um, the mirror mist is parallel path, so it doesn't, doesn't tend to clog as easily. Um, for, for best sensitivity, generally we use the, the Meinhardt concentrics and, and the, the PFA concentric nebulizers. And then you also have to take into account what your matrix is. So if if you have hydrofluoric acid present there, you're going to have to use a nebulizer that has uh, resistance to hydrofluoric acid. So generally a plastic uh, PFA or a peak or some sort of plastic nebulizer. Um, and also care and feeding. You know, <laughs> one of one of my uh, recommendations like for multi-user labs, universities and, and things like that where they have different people coming in, you know, you want a robust nebulizer. Um, so generally yeah. glass ones uh, don't work so well because they, they can be easily broken and easily damaged. So uh, lots, lots of considerations. There, there, there are. So. There, as I kind of said, that could be its own <laughs> webinar and its own. Yep, um, yep. I was, sure. I was yeah, check check the website. We went, we might do a webinar on that that might be an, selection here yeah. in the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's actually not a bad topic. Um, okay, I, I'll do two more questions. That I see, I think, we, and then we'll we'll wrap it up for today. Thank everyone okay. for there. Um, so this one I thought was a good one, good comment, uh, question. So if you're still seeing good matrix spike recoveries despite a strong bias in one way or another. Uh, on the internal standard, either low or or high internal standard response, is that a good sign that everything is working properly? So um, if you're still seeing good matrix spike recoveries, basically, and you're seeing internal standard suppression or enhancement. Yeah, it it can be um, within within limits um, because you can still have interferences there um, and still get good. Spike spike recoveries, even though your your internal standard is, you know, suppressed down to 50%. Um, I get a little worried when my internal standards get down that low. And usually I'll I'll do a dilution test, you know, to to see if I get the same same results. So 
I mean, it's an indication things are, your internal standard is working okay, but there are still some interferences that you'll get decent spike recovery. Um, Good point. Under those conditions. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then one last question. Any tips for analyzing about 200 part per billion levels of lithium in the presence of 10,000 part per million levels of sodium? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I could. I mean, for me, I've done some of this work in, yep. in some, some, you know, different brines and so forth. And uh, typically, what I've done is I've tried to method of standard addition. Really, to really yep. do the best is I try my best to to have a ten thousand ppm sodium calibration solution. Yep on top of that my unknown yeah although it's tough in in some circumstances your 10,000 ppm might might end up putting your plasma out so um <laughs> you know <laughs> that's one thing to look at you might you might have to dilute it a little um but yeah doing method of standard additions um would probably help and be careful with with what lines you're using Mm -hmm. yeah yeah that that one that's you know usually uh, that one's a, a tricky application sometimes and again then you know you know sodium usually has lithium in there yeah. too so it's tough to find yeah. if you're looking for another standard or something like that a reference um probably has some some lithium background all right, well, thank everybody. I'm going to uh, wrap it up for today, but thank everybody for joining. I'm sorry, I know there's a few other questions there. Um, if you have any burning questions, feel free to reach out to Ruth or I. Um, you can also check out some of the other webinars we've done at this URL. You'll receive a link to it, of course. And I want to thank uh, everybody, and uh, thank you, Ruth, for your presentation today. It was fantastic and yep. uh, hope to see everybody uh, next time in two weeks we have the one on icpms so feel free to uh, sign up and join them same time same thanks. place thanks. thanks everybody